There are a number of New Testament passages where we're explicitly taught that the food laws have come to an end for God's people. And of course, our Hebrew roots friends, like Mr. Judah, attempt to reinterpret these passages in a way that aligns with their belief that those commands are still in effect. So we're going to test Mr. Judah's claims against Scripture. And we'll start with the passage that seems to generate the most emotion among Torah-observant Christians. As you know, Mark chapter 7 records the account of the Pharisees criticizing Jesus because his disciples were eating with hands that were unwashed. And Jesus calls them hypocrites, and he uses this opportunity to teach this larger lesson about what truly defiles a person. He first teaches the crowd and then speaks privately to his disciples. So picking up at verse 17, we read, and when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? For it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. And the line in parentheses at the end of verse 19, Thus he declared all foods clean, has prompted all sorts of protests from Hebrew Roots teachers. Because that line so clearly and plainly teaches at face value that Jesus brought the food laws to an end, which of course disproves the entire theology of Torahism, it's been the subject of countless conspiracy theories trying to explain what it means or even challenge that the text shouldn't be there at all. Mr. Judah is no exception. Let's let him fully explain his position on this verse. Thus he declared all foods clean. What? The subject is not about foods. The subject is about how does man defile himself. And some well-meaning Christian back hundreds of years ago decided that he thought that's what that was talking about, and he wrote those words in. In fact, look in your Bible. And when you find those words at Mark 7, 19, you'll find there's a set of parentheses around them. That statement, thus he declared all foods clean. Put a little set of parentheses around it. Go to the front of your Bible, and it will tell you about the Bible you have, and it says this. Anytime you find a text that has some parentheses around it, that means that text was not in the original manuscripts that they have. That was added by some churchman and it gets printed in the Bible. So the whole statement, thus he declared all foods clean, is a flat out lie. That was never said by Yeshua. That's not the conclusion of that teaching. It's what was added by some Gentile Christians to justify eating unclean things. Instead of following the commandments of God, we'll have the Messiah nullify the commandments of God, which is what they like to teach, and thus, those words are put in there. That is absolutely false information in the New Testament. Forgive me for being passionate about this. And maybe, you know, you're a bacon lover, and you like your pork chops, and you like your lobster and your shrimp. I, I got it. But as I'm about ready to tell you, God says, if you eat that stuff, you're not holy. You're un. Holy. Oh my goodness. Okay, so one of the telltale signs that our theology has hit a brick wall and simply cannot be squared with what the Bible says is when we start rejecting the parts of Scripture that don't fit our theology. Instead of submitting ourselves to the authority of Scripture and adjusting our worldview accordingly, we begin trying to adjust the Bible to match what we believe. To paraphrase Augustine, if you only believe the parts of the Bible that you like and reject the parts that you don't, it's not scripture you believe, but yourself. And this is exactly what we see here with Mr. Judah. He's rejecting the parts of scripture that don't fit his theology. I mean, you have to wonder if he took a 
big red pen and crossed out those words in his Bible. He's making claims here that not only have zero evidence behind them, they're demonstrably wrong. Let me explain why I say that. Let's look at the statement he just made from two different perspectives. First, we'll examine the manuscript evidence and test his claim about the phrase, thus he declared all foods clean, being added hundreds of years ago by a scribe. And then we'll look at it through a theological, theological lens to see what Jesus meant in this passage. And we're going to see, in both cases, exactly why Mr. Judah's position on this verse just doesn't work. So, Mr. Judah claims that the words, thus he declared all foods clean, weren't in the, in the earliest manuscripts, but were added later. And in a minute, you'll see that, yes, they are in the earliest manuscripts. But for now, for the sake of argument, let's suppose he's right. So, how did that happen? How did those false words end up in our Bibles? Well, Mr. Judah first says this. Some well-meaning Christian back hundreds of years ago decided that he thought that's what that was talking about, and he wrote those words in. Okay, so he claims that hundreds of years ago, an unnamed, well-intentioned Christian was reading through Mark 7 and thought to himself, you know what? I'm going to add an extra phrase to the Bible to help explain what Jesus is talking about here. And here's the problem with that theory. We have thousands of manuscripts that include all or parts of the Gospel of Mark. And Bible scholars recognize no such editing in Mark 7.19. And I'll get to evidence of that in just a minute. So, in order for Mr. Judah's theory to be true, here's what would have had to happen. That unnamed, well-meaning churchman, after adding his extra text to the manuscript he was reading, would have had to then create forged copies of every manuscript of Mark in existence. Because you can't simply write extra words in an existing manuscript without it being noticed, right? And then he would need to take those forgeries and sneak into all of the monasteries and churches and institutions across the world where those other manuscripts of Mark were stored and replace them with his version. And he would have had to complete this mission without ever being caught and without his forgeries ever being detected because if anyone found out what this guy did, they would sound the alarm and tell everyone that the Bible's been tampered with. And that's not all. Hundreds of years later then, a man on the other side of the world named Monte Judah would need to somehow become aware of what this scribe secretly did. So that doesn't sound very reasonable at all, does it? And if you were paying close attention to that clip we just saw, Mr. Judah actually offered a second theory in the same breath. And that second theory is even more far-fetched. It's what was added by some Gentile Christians to justify eating unclean things. Instead of following the commandments of God, we'll have the Messiah nullify the commandments of God, which is what they like to teach, and thus those words are put in there. So this second theory now chalks it up to willful deception rather than a well-meaning Christian who's trying to explain what the text means. Mr. Judah now has a Gentile Christian who explicitly wanted to justify eating unclean things, and this nefarious scribe decided, hey, Let's just add a quick little phrase here and have the Messiah nullify those food laws. That way, we can eat pork chops and bacon. <laughs> but of course, this second theory still leaves the problem of the scribe having to make thousands of forgeries and sneak into all of those institutions. But now the motivation behind it is to undermine the Word of God rather than to clarify it. So just on a logical basis, this theory about edited text is absurd. And it reveals a surprising lack of awareness about the history of Bible manuscripts and how we got our modern English translations of the Bible. But, as they say on late night TV, that's not all. Mr. Judah also made a statement about the parentheses we see in this verse, and it contains a glaring contradiction. He said, Anytime you find a text that has some parentheses around it, that means that text was not in the original manuscripts that they have. Did you catch that? He's saying that text wasn't in the original manuscripts, but was added by someone, and then the translators of the Bible noticed the fake text and decided to 
put it in parentheses. So if that's true, then Mr. Judah's sneaky scribe theory falls apart because someone caught on to his editing, and yet they decided to leave the fake text in the Bible anyway? No, that's not what those parentheses mean at all. And Mark is actually the perfect book of the Bible to explain why. Because there is some debate about the ending of Mark's gospel that shows us just how translators handle this very issue. As I said, there are thousands of manuscripts in the New Testament, and they don't always agree with one another. Some manuscripts contain a line or even a passage that's missing in other manuscripts. And through a process called textual criticism, which I explain in another video that I'll link to below, translators are able to determine with a great deal of accuracy what the original writing said. But there are some cases where they're just not sure. And in those cases, what most translators do is include the text in question and add a note of explanation about it. And that's exactly the case in the last chapter of Mark. So let's check it out using BibleGateway.com. This is a free website that anyone can use, so you can go investigate this for yourself. So all manuscripts of Mark include uh, verses 1 through 8 of the last chapter, chapter 16. But verses 9 through 20 are in question. And you can see here that in the ESV translation, they interrupt the flow of the text to alert the reader about this manuscript discrepancy. Some of the earliest manuscripts do not include verses 9 through 20. And on top of that, they've placed a double bracket around the text in question. So let's look at a couple other translations to see how they handle this. How about the NIV? Okay, so they put a line at the end of verse 8, then they add a bracketed comment about verses 9 through 20, and they put the debatable text in italics. How about the New King's James, King James Version? So they don't have an inline note, but if we turn on the footnotes, we'll see they acknowledge verses 9 through 20 and even offer a little more information. We're told that verses 9 through 20 are bracketed in NU as not in the original text. So NU is an abbreviation for a different Greek manuscript than the one that the King James Bibles use. And this footnote is them acknowledging that other manuscripts indicate that verses 9 through 20 are not in the original text. And there's a little more info here, but every translation handles this issue of debatable text a little differently, but none of them just ignore it. Well, actually, the original King James Bible doesn't mention it, but every other major English translation does. Even the Message Bible men mentions it. And none of these translations use parentheses to indicate that the text is not found in some manuscripts. Now, let's go check out Mark 7.19 in these same translations to see how they handle that phrase. So the ESV puts that phrase in parentheses, but offers no indication that it's missing in any manuscripts. And by the way, there were no parentheses in the original Greek language, right? These are English punctuation, punctuation marks, which some English translators use to help clarify the text for the reader. And if we turn on the red letter feature, we can see that they aren't part of the red letter words of Jesus. So the reason some translations put that phrase in parentheses is to make sure the reader is aware that the text is a comment from Mark, the author of the gospel, rather than the words of Jesus. Let's see what the NIV does. Okay, they also put the phrase in parentheses and offer no indication that the text is missing in some manuscripts. And how about the New King James Version? Okay, here we have no parentheses and a footnote explaining NU, which is that other Greek manuscript, sets off the final phrase as Mark's comment that Jesus has declared all foods clean. So they're acknowledging the differences between manuscripts in this footnote and informing their readers that the ESV and NIV and other translations mark that phrase in parentheses to indicate that they're the words of Mark, not Jesus. So what does all this tell us? Well, first of all, it shows how off-base Mr. Judah's teaching is. There are no translations or other evidence anywhere that suggest the phrase, thus he declared all foods clean, was missing in any manuscript. And number two, 
it shows that Mr. Judah's statement about what the parentheses in your Bible mean is also inaccurate. Anytime you find a text that has some parentheses around it, that means that text was not in the original manuscripts that they have. No, the parentheses are there to indicate that these are the words of the author of the Gospel of Mark, not the words of Jesus. And those words are found in the earliest manuscripts we have. Let me show you. Let's look at the Codex Sinaiticus, which is the oldest complete copy of the Greek New Testament that we have. And it's online. I'll, I'll put a link to it below if you want to explore it for yourself. Okay, and what's nice about this website is that it's got the Greek text over here and the English text here below it, which is helpful if, like me, you're not an expert in Greek. So when you click on the Greek text here, it'll highlight that text in the image of the actual manuscript. And check this out. Mark 7, verse 19, and there's the text in question. Katharizon, panta, ta, bromata. What does that mean? Okay, real quick Greek lesson. So grammatically, the first word of this phrase, katharizon, is functioning in this sentence as a present active participle. It's an action word. And it's nominative, masculine, and singular, which tells us that in this context, in verse 19, the word katharizon is referring to Jesus. Jesus is the one doing the action. And what did he do? What's the action? Well, this participle comes from the lexical form of katharizo, which means to cleanse. So it's telling us that Jesus cleansed or made something clean. Or if we want to use the pronoun, he cleansed. And what did he cleanse? Well, panta means all or every, and bromata means food. So Jesus cleansed or made clean all or every food. Or, as the majority of English translations render it, he declared all foods clean. So in verse 19, Mark, the author of this gospel, tells us that when Jesus taught that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, he was declaring all foods clean. So, Mr. Judah is mistaken. The early manuscripts do include that text. And there's no getting around the fact that Jesus declared all foods clean. This one phrase in the New Testament is enough to settle the entire discussion about kosher food. Or at least it would be if our Hebrew Roots friends would stop trying to cross it out in their Bibles. And in case you're not already convinced, there's another compelling aspect to this passage, uh, passage in Mark 7, and it has to do with Yeshua's own words. The Torah in Leviticus 11 teaches that eating unclean animals would cause the Israelites to defile themselves. Verse 43, You shall not make yourselves detestable with any swarming thing that swarms, and you shall not defile yourselves with them and become unclean through them. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. So, Putting unclean foods into their bodies would defile the Israelites and make them ritually unclean. And in this scene in Mark 7, we have the Pharisees, the strictest of the Jewish sects, interacting with Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, and his Jewish disciples. This was an intramural discussion among first century Jews. Everyone here knew full well what Leviticus 11 teaches about becoming defiled by eating unclean animals. Now, in Mark 7, the confrontation began when the Pharisees challenged Jesus specifically about eating food with unwashed hands. That's where the conversation started, which, Jesus points out, was just a man-made tradition, not part of the law. And then, as he so often does, Jesus used that specific question to teach on the broader topic of what really defiles a person. He said this, picking up at verse 14, And he called the people to him again and said, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Again, Leviticus 11 says that when unclean animals go into a person, that person is defiled and made unclean. But here in Mark 7, Jesus says, 
There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. This was a shocking statement. In fact, Matthew recorded this same confrontation in his gospel, and his accounts his account includes an extra detail. He writes this, chapter 15, verse 12. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Well, of course they were, because they understood that he was declaring all foods clean. And by the way, you'll often hear our Hebrew roots friends say that when food is mentioned during this confrontation, it only refers to what Jews considered to be actual food, meaning ritual, ritually clean food. But if that were the case, then Jesus would be declaring all clean foods clean, even though they're already clean. And that certainly wouldn't offend the Pharisees. They would have no problem with Jesus calling clean food clean. Now, Jesus was declaring all food clean, and that was offensive to the Pharisees. I mean, this was a very surprising thing for his Jewish listeners to hear. So much so that even his own disciples didn't understand what he was saying. Let's keep reading in Mark 7. So his disciples asked him about the parable, and they weren't just asking him to share a little more info out of curiosity. They genuinely didn't understand what he had just said. They were confused. Verse 18, And he said to them, And are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? So Yeshua is repeating the same thing again in private to his Jewish disciples because, again, the Torah teaches that there are foods that by going into a person can defile them and make them unclean. But here in Mark 7, Jesus says, whatever, and the Greek word there is pos, which means all or every, whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him. And this is how I, how I think this next phrase ended up in our Bibles. Right. So we know that at some point, decades after the actual confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees, Mark decided to write his gospel. Right? And by the way, it's traditionally held that this gospel was written by John Mark, who, who's mentioned a number of times in the New Testament. He was the Apostle Peter's younger associate, and he also traveled and worked closely with Paul and Barnabas, and, and he wanted to produce a written record to confirm to the world that Jesus really was who he said he was. So I imagine the author sitting down. Now, there's no evidence of this. It's just my imagination. But he sits down and begins to write it all out, right? He may have been taking notes from Peter, who was, who was an eyewitness to all the things that Jesus taught. And when it comes to Yeshua's clash with the Pharisees over the washing of hands, Mark begins to write down what happened that day. And he's reflecting on this event decades later. And the things that Jesus had said that day, he wants to make sure that none of his readers miss the importance of the Lord's teaching. And he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he, or maybe Peter, if he was taking dictation, sensed that his readers would have the same questions that the disciples did that day. Because Jesus made a shocking declaration. So Mark adds a brief comment in the middle of the words of Jesus to, to clarify what Jesus was teaching. Thus he declared all foods clean. It's almost like Mark saying, Yes, my Jewish readers. Yes, my Hebrew roots friends. You read that correctly. Jesus declared all foods clean. And the fact that Jesus taught this it's confirmed over and over again in how those food laws are later addressed in the other books of the New Testament. As just one example, if Jesus did not teach that the food laws had come to an end, how could the Apostle Paul write this in Colossians 2? Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one judge you on these issues. The food and drink commands were a shadow of things to come, a shadow that pointed to Christ. Mm -hmm.